this number here represents the cost of R&D by the global pharmaceutical industry in 2010. The, this number we have seen before, and um, it's a huge number. While this number and this cost is steadily increasing, actually dramatically has increased, in the last 15 years, the number of drugs approved by the FDA has dramatically decreased. And a significant portion of this cost never materializes in marketable drugs. There are probably many reasons for that, but there is one point in the drug development process where many drugs indeed fail. And this happens when the transition takes place from preclinical animal trials to the human clinical trials. Why drugs fail at this point? And in fact, about 20 to 50% of the drugs fail. And the cost loss could be up to $500 million, representing about the third or half of what is needed today to bring a drug to the market. The fact of the matter is that we are not animals. So what can work for an animal doesn't necessarily work for a human. An animal model may not be representative for the human. Think about a rat model of Alzheimer. Maybe uh, if we could test the drug before we administer it to a human, we could learn something and we could save money. So how to test the drug before human clinical trials on human? That's a bizarre idea. But maybe not quite. In principle, we could imagine that we take a fresh cadaveric liver and use it to test a liver drug. Well, that's a bizarre idea indeed, because uh, those organs are in high demand for other more noble applications. But maybe this is not such a bizarre idea. What if we engineer a little teeny tiny liver from human cells or liver tissue and use this liver tissue to interface between animal trials and human clinical trials. If this tissue resembles, or even the equivalent, to human liver, architecturally, structurally, and even functionally, then we can use it to test the drug, let's say, after successful or promising animal trials, we would use it, this construct, to use on human constructs and then move on if the, the tests are positive. So how to engineer such constructs? And that's exactly what we do at Organovo. And I'm going to demonstrate it here. So you see the printer in action. It's building some complex three-dimensional structure out of living cells. And at the same time, you see uh, uh, in the schematic mode, how we make from spherical aggregates, which are our bi buying particles composed of living cells, we make a, a tubular structure. And on the, on the right, you could see how this tubular structure came about by printing cylindrical buying particles uh, from, uh, from two kinds of cylinders. The blue ones are hydrogel, and the white one is made of living cells and we use a template for printing, which is so shown in the upper right corner. Now, once the buying particle has been delivered, has been, has been printed, something magical happens. And you could see that on the, on the illustration. This buying particles fuse, and that's how the biological structure, in this case, the tubular structure, comes about. And this is one of the distinguishing features of this technology. This technology uses exclusively cellular material. It's fully biological. The buying particles are three-dimensional, teeny tiny tissue constructs with thousands of cells already in them. So the cells from the very beginning are in this three-dimensional environment. They adhere to their bodies. They communicate with them. They signal to them just as they would do under in vivo conditions. And fusion itself is one of the 
most fundamental morphogenetic processes, shape-forming processes, that the embryo uses when it develops from a featureless, more or less spheroidal shape into something as complex as we are, with myriad of shapes, complex shapes and forms inside. Once this fusion and other morphogenetic processes that we use in this, in this technology, uh, by the way, just want to remind you that, that when, when, when the fusion takes place after the deposition, which is really what we do here, we really let nature do what it does very well. It forms the complex biological structures. So once this fusion has taken place, we transfer the construct into um, a bioreactor, which is a device where near physiological conditions are provided to the maturing structure. And indeed, we mature this vascular graft here uh, and train it until it is ready for use, which can be testing drugs to, use, to be used as a disease model or eventually for implantation. And here are some of those tubes, vascular structures that are ready for use. And here is another example. We take spheroidal binding particles, this time composed of cardiomyocytes and uh, fibroblasts, typical cells that make up our heart. We deposit them in this discrete array, and then we wait until they fuse, the magic takes place, and then we transfer the construct into the bioreactor, we mature it, and lo and behold, after a certain amount of time, the structure starts beating in unison synchronously. So this is a piece of functional heart tissue. We can take this tissue, we can use it as a cardiac patch to repair this functional part of the cardiac muscle, we can again use it as a disease model. We can use it as in tox toxicology assays. And uh, besides this heart tissue, we're able today make lung tissue, liver tissue, and we make constructs for oncological studies. So where can this technology take us? This number represents the age of the longest living human being on records and that of a French lady, Jean Calmont. How far can we go beyond this? In fact, there is no scientifically established upper limit to longevity. Well, that's another question, whether we would want to live, extend our old age, especially when we are going downhill. But what about if we could maintain our capacities? I'm sure that in that case, many of us would like to live longer. And maybe this technology could one day take us there. Because it's not only tissues that we can print, but eventually we could print even more complex structures. In fact, a vascular graft is already an organoid. And if we combine such vascular graft with the complex tissues like the heart tissue that I showed you, eventually we can build more complex structures, organ structures, somehow like this. Is it science fiction? Maybe, but maybe not. And what is important to note here, we say, no, 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 no this is impossible. Well, I in fact believe that we probably will never get to the point that we could engineer complex organs that we carry in our body to the mini detail. That's the bad news. But the good news is, at least in my opinion, that this is not necessary. We don't have to recreate evolution. What we need to do is to engineer organ structures, organs that are functionally equivalent, but not identical two hours. So the saying that if it looks like a cat, it behaves like a cat, and makes meow, then it's a cat, in this case could be simplified. If it functions like a heart, then it is a heart. 
So then with a little stretch of imagination, one day we might walk into a specialized facility, shed our dysfunctional organ, and have one made to measure. Somehow, like suggested here. Thank you very much.